since I haven't done Italian before. Um, we had started uh, in the last time uh, to deal with this general problem of chaotic synchronization. And the reasons are many. The uh, simplest kinds of systems that one can solve all tend to be linear systems or you know, simplified models of nonlinear behavior like the Kuramoto or whatever. And in general, most systems that we will encounter in real life, if not extremely chaotic, at least they are uh, the kinds of systems where several kinds of behavior can take place. So it's important to understand uh, synchrony in a somewhat general setting. Um, this is just a picture I already showed you yesterday of uh, two, two chaotic systems when coupled by this so-called master-slave uh, geometry. After a while, the master takes over the slave completely. All right? So uh, the dynamics becomes identical. Now, this is a subject that has been studied for a long time, so there are all sorts of variations that are possible. Uh, and all of this comes under a framework which, for want of a better name, is called generalized synchrony. And the general um, scenario is the following. You have one equation let's say for some function y, which is uncoupled to the rest. And the equation for one subsystem depends on y. Um, okay. All right, so again, this is to be thought of as a master and a slave, if you like. But this is only a, a, a general idea, yeah? Okay, the, the equation for the master doesn't depend on the slave. See, this equation for y is just a function of y and maybe other things. Did you get your umbrella back? Parapluie, did you got your umbrella? It's in the, uh, it's in the main desk. Okay, so this, this is a master only because it doesn't depend on any other variables. And that's a slave because that slave is getting input from the master. Okay? I'm, you see, I mean, and of course, this is just mathematics, but I'm thinking of, let us say, cells that are coupled by some chemicals or what have you. I mean, I'm just imagining the kinds of situations you might like to apply this kind of model to. You know, so cells mediated by small molecules, uh, the production of the small molecules is independent of the cells, and that happens, right? Or you have a set of neurons, and they are driven by some calcium wave that comes from somewhere else, and those, the, that dynamics is independent of what happens to the uh, neurons, but of course the neurons depend on what happens. So it's just... The, you call it unidirectional coupling, master, slave, whatever, whatever. Okay? All right. Now, just... Right, so the idea is that for a suitable amount of coupling, there can be this so-called generalization, uh, generalized synchronization, when the response is a unique function of the drive. Okay, and this is just expanding your notion of what does it mean for two systems to synchronize. If they are identical, we can all recognize it. If they are out of phase, we can all recognize it. If they are related by some kind of mathematical transform, it's not always easy to recognize. For example, you can imagine this uh, situation where here is your master, 
and the master has got some chaotic, maybe it's a chaotic master, so you've got some chaotic uh, drive over here. You couple it to the system, and the response also looks chaotic. Right? And this is quite to be expected, because we saw the example of a forced uh, oscillator. When you force one oscillator with another, then you typically have overtones, and you have a combination of both the motions. So regardless of what the dynamics of Y is, once you impose a chaotic drive on it, the response is going to be some funny thing. Now, it's very difficult to look at this and say, because it's not identical to the master, you'd say that, aha, this is clearly synchronization. So what people have done over the years is to do the so-called auxiliary system approach. Namely, you take one copy of the master and one copy of the slave, and then you make another copy of the slave. If the two slaves are exactly in, in the same response to the master, then the two slaves will be perfectly synchronized. It's not a particularly deep idea, but so you've got some complicated, uh, so here is the example. Here you've got x as the master and y as the slave. Yeah? And, uh, okay, so when they are uncoupled, this is, the variable on the x-axis is the master, the variable on the y-axis is the slave. So when they are uncoupled, you just get some un, not entirely uncorrelated mess, because you can see some, something over there, but okay. Let's just say for small epsilon, you don't get any particular dependence over there. For intermediate epsilon, you get another function which looks kind of like that, but if you looked at the actual response of y, it would be quite chaotic looking. See? Okay. Okay. So this is the master. Independent of y or y prime, right? So what I have done over here is to plot the master variable versus the slave variable. Both of them go in 0, 1. Yeah? And let's say the coupling is very weak over here, but still there is no synchronization of any kind. When the coupling is very strong, the variables become identical, so it is completely synchronized. Right? Here, what I've done is to take slave one and slave two. Yeah? So slave one versus slave two is uncorrelated to start with. That's what that mess over there is. But here, when the master and the slave have got some complicated relation, the two slaves have the same complicated relation, so Slave 1 versus slave 2 is on that diagonal manifold. Slave 1 doesn't depend on slave 2. In the y no, it's slave 1 doesn't depend on slave 2, but they're both linked to the master. The response to the master is unique. Even if slave 2 depends both on the master and on slave 1. I... Right? I mean, it's, I mean, the, the jury is not out on this. I'm, I'm going to give you all one problem, which is an open problem, not to be solved necessarily this week. But those of you who would enjoy playing around with these kinds of systems, um, the scenario for generalized synchronization is not always master-slave. It can be bidirectional. I mean, to my belief, this is one of the most common kinds of synchrony that happens. Because most couple systems are not identical. And so it's, it's, I'll, I'll just give you a problem. You solve it if you like. <laughs> it's the best kind of problem, right? <laughs> OK. So 
the, the, the main result that I want you to, be, to look at is this. You've got the master, slave one or slave two will both look like this. Okay? And if you plot slave one versus slave two, they are identical, even though the dynamics looks crazy. All right? Yeah? You see, the assertion about generalized synchrony is that the, the, the response is a unique function of the drive. How do we visualize that? That it is a unique function. You make two of them and then say, right? Not the deepest idea, but it works. I mean, that, that is almost the point of the open problem that I'm just setting for you. OK. So now this, this assumes a lot of interest in the kinds of systems that you know, complex, uh, you know, people who study complexity like to look at. Supposing I had two dynamical systems, but they were subject to the same noise. Identical noise, uh, namely, uh, I mean, so here we are all dynamical systems of some kind, right? And if you are subject to some immense amount of external noise, right, would our response to the noise be the same? Yeah? Now, this is actually a, a, the subject of a, so what, uh, Banavar and Maritan discovered in, in a, I don't know, many years ago, and they had it published in PRL, uh, was to take this chaotic system, which you'll have all seen, uh, x is equal to 4x into 1 minus x. You know, this is the logistic map with maximum uh, thing, right? And uh, they added, they took two copies of it, here, y and y prime are written as x and y. So, right? They took two copies of it and added the same noise. So they had a signal which they generated, and at each step, they added exactly the same noise to both the systems. And uh, okay, so what does synchrony over here mean? The distance between x and y goes to 0. They become identical, and that's the thing. And what they showed was, uh, here's a picture which I just took straight out of their paper, all right? Uh, if the noise was identical, then the trajectories coincided after n steps, where n depended on the precision of the calculation. Yeah? This noise here is just the... Uh, Gaussian. Stochastic noise? Yeah, stochastic noise. Yeah. That, because that depends on the precision of the calculation. See, the, the, the point about the precision is, this is a, okay, this is a controversial paper with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I'm, okay, I mean, I'm just putting this out to you because when we say that you're being driven by a common system, I mean, think of this as two copies of the same system, and this eta is a drive which does not depend on x or y. It's the same scenario. It is a scenario of generalized synchronization. But I'm bringing it up because today when you do applications or when you think about looking at complexity in such systems, having an external noise is a very important thing. All right? So, uh, and, and here you see actually how the, uh, the difference between the two goes you know, rapidly down to zero. And the point about the precision of the calculation is that once you are down to zero, you will, if the distance go, between them goes to zero, it will stay zero forever. Okay? Yeah? Functions, 
they can all scenarios are possible if you have the right coupling then things with different functional forms can also show this kind of synchrony by synchrony over here we don't mean that the dynamics is identical all that we mean is that somehow the correlations between the two systems are so strong that uh, as i will in the next few slides i'm going to argue that this brings things on to a low dimensional manifold yeah Yeah. So the, the systems go exponentially to the same same area. Yeah. But then eventually they are not going to diverge. Yeah. Because you see, there are directions in which things diverge. Okay. In the in Lorentz system, for example, there are three Lyapunov exponents. One is positive. One is zero. One is negative. All right. So things will diverge along the direction of the positive Lyapunov exponent, and they will converge in the direction of the negative Lyapunov exponent. All right. So if you don't have more than one positive Lyapunov exponent, all right, generally what will happen is that things will converge along this side, and they will diverge along this side. What happens in um, okay? You see, when you've got these attractors which have got different shapes and the different parts of the uh, system, you know that all parts of this attractor are not uniformly attract. Uh, di they are not uniformly expanding or contracting. If you take, uh, everyone has studied the the logistic map. Yeah, all right. So, if you take the logistic map. Right, um, you know. So you've got x n plus one is equal to a. Let me just say this is f of x n. Right. Now, the uh, if I have got a fixed point of this map, let me call that x star. Right. So let me take x star in a small displacement from that. Right. Uh, n plus one. This is equal to f of x star plus delta, right? And this is just equal to f of x star, which is 0, right? x star is such that this is 0, uh, plus delta n times uh, f prime of x star, right? To first order, just first order Taylor expansion. And on this side, I've just got x star n plus 1, which is the same as f of x star. So I cancel that out. And I've got delta n plus 1. So delta n plus 1 is just f prime of x star times delta n. right? So depending on where x star is, right? this is telling us that the instability is just proportional to the slope. Now the slope over here, right? Over here the slope is, I mean, whatever the, it's it's some positive number, right? When I come here, it becomes negative. So the slope is some positive number. It goes to some negative. It crosses zero at this point. It is zero, and then it goes down to some negative number over there, right? So in the entire region where the slope is from minus 1, so this is slope 1, and this is slope minus 1, this entire region is contracting, right?
See, I'm just looking at deviations from x star. How do they propagate? They propagate as a function of the slope at x star. Just Taylor expansion, man. See, th this is one term plus delta n squared f double prime by two factor, et cetera, et cetera. I'm ignoring all this. Yeah? This one? Because x, is, x star is a fixed point. So xn star is just f of xn. Those two just cancel out. Yeah. Is there any proof on the statement? Which? On the the proof about this? Yeah. 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 So what what I want to uh, what I want to say is that on any attractor. Lorenz, Rossler, logistic map, whatever, the slope is not uniformly, it's not unstable everywhere. I think when we were talking about Lyapunov exponents, people were asking, you know, there are parts of phase space which will be pulling you in. There are parts of phase space that will be, you know, pulling you out. Right? So it's not as if the uh, phase space is uniformly attracting or uniformly contracting, all right? Uh, you, if you remember my, in my discussion of the total Lyapunov exponent, I said that this was equal to some of, something like this, limit of n going to infinity, uh, one by n, um, summation of i going from one to n, log of f prime at i, right? This is the expression for the Lyapunov exponent because we were going, making many, many, many steps, looking at the expansion or the contraction, taking the logarithm and summing it, and this was the expression. Now, it turns out that the Lyapunov exponent is the average rate of contraction, or it's the average rate. So if I find, if I, if I just take the Lyapunov exponent for one step, Right? And ask what is the uh, distribution, it could look something like this. Well, this is the average Lyapunov exponent, but this is what the distribution of these terms looks like. So you can get a positive Lyapunov exponent, right? Let's say this is zero, but there will be some parts of this trajectory where the Lyapunov exponent is actually negative. And there are some parts where it is positive. And the average together gives you more than, you know, makes it positive. But it's also likely that if you take your averages properly, um, you know, or, or depending on the trajectory in question, uh, there could be different parts. I mean, the zero might be here, in which case the Lyapunov exponent is negative. But there will still, or there could still be parts of it which are positive. Okay? Meaning that, you know, when you're taking the sum of an infinite number of terms, it's actually the distribution that you have to look at. The average is what the Lyapunov exponent tells you, right? But if you look at the finite time variance of any of these quantities, those variances can be quite large. Right? I mean, like today, we also look at situations where the entropy is, the change in entropy is positive, but there are parts of that entire trajectory where the entropy is negative. The change is, delta S is negative, right? Jarzinski's theorem and all that, right? So the point about why these come together is that occasionally, just very occasionally, these trajectories go and hit a huge negative part. When they hit a huge negative part, they come together. And if they hit this negative part often enough, 
they come together and then they stay there. And how long they will stay there really depends on the precision of the calculation. If you're keeping 27 places of decimal and you know, the difference is in, in the second or the third place, not going to happen. Yeah? All right. Now, the point is that you can therefore have noise-induced synchronization. That is, you just subject some systems to the same noise and they will show this kind of synchronization. Right. And, okay, so this is just what I said. What people showed was that if you come to large contracting parts of the phase space, right. okay. now where does this apply? And I was just... Uh, thinking of one situation which people do study. If you've got populations in different islands, and the islands are close by, and they don't allow migration between the two, then um, because the climate itself is fluctuating, and both populations of whatever species you care to look at, I think they were looking at sheep or squirrels, or something like that. So you've got two populations which are unconnected to one another, and they are subject to the same weather fluctuations. The populations of the two islands show very strong correlations. And you don't do things like put a predator on one and kill off all the sheep or something like that, meaning you just have try to do as similar things as possible. There will be variations in the climate even though they are very close by, but okay, so this is, uh, I mean, this was an observation which has then also called, been now called an effect, it's called the Moran effect. So people do study uh, the co-fluctuations of populations <coughs> subject to the same weather or other conditions, right? Uh, so, the Moran's theorem states that a pair of spatially separated populations obeying identical dynamics in the absence of dispersal, so that is, you're not allowed to migrate between the two islands, and subject to random climate fluctuations, will demonstrate a cross-correlation that is equivalent to the correlation of the climates. Okay? Now, in some senses... Uh, okay? Amusing? No. No, it's, it's, see, they observed it in Scotland and wrote a paper in Nature, and that was it. But yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, that's what the um, uh, obeying identical dynamics, right? If you have sheep on one and foxes on the other, they're not obeying identical dynamics, right? Okay. So they also they've also studied these blue tits and other such uh, things. Right? Now I know that you know today when we study uh, complexity, biological systems are among the more interesting kinds of systems where uh, synchrony etc is to be observed. And uh, I just want to point out that biological rhythms range from fractions of seconds microseconds, less even, all the way up to years. So there are ranges of time scales, and then worrying about how these are all coupled to one another is a, is a problem, right? So neural rhythms, are, you know, up to 10 seconds and below that even, right? Cardiac rhythms, typically for healthy hearts, is about once a second. Calcium oscillations, which main thing in sort of communication between cells, seconds to minutes, biochemical oscillations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, and the rhythms in ecology and epidemiology uh, go over years, right? So, the idea of "quote unquote" synchronization has to be expanded to also include these various time scales, All right? Now, um, 
there is a whole branch of this called stochastic synchronization. Um, namely, if you've got systems that are already intrinsically noisy, not subject to external noise, but something which is intrinsically noisy, let's say cells, uh, you know, uh, reactions within cells, then how does, you know, how do these synchronize? I will come to this a little later because I think that that's, uh, uh, I mean, I, I want to get this idea across. Right? What we've already seen in the uh, pictures that I've shown you about chaotic systems synchronizing is that once you come to the, the uh, state of synchrony, you are on a lower dimensional submanifold. Just take it as a lower dimensional subspace on which all your, di uh, your dynamics is occurring. Because if you've got two Lorenz systems, one Lorenz is three dimensions, the other Lorenz is three dimensions, and the total dynamics takes place in six dimensions. But finally, you come down to the case where x1 is equal to y1, x2 is equal to y2, x3 is equal to y3, and that defines a three dimensional subspace. So the synchronization manifold is three dimensions inside a total of six. Right. Now, if you want synchronization to be stable, perturbations away from this manifold should bring you back to the manifold. Because once you are synchronized, uh, as you asked, how long will they stay together? In the case of the Banavar Maritan business, it was it depends on the uh, precision of the calculation. But basically what that's saying is that, you know, if your perturbations away from this manifold are very strong, then you can come onto this manifold and then after a while you'll drift apart, and which may or may not be useful to you. Right. Okay, so I'm making this proposal that any coupling that brings the dynamics to a lower dimensional subspace is some form of synchrony, all right? Uh, okay. Now this, in generalized synchronization, the formalism, one second, let me just try to, oops. Okay, so what I'm going to, sorry. Okay, so I have one dynamical system. This underbar means it's a vector, right? This is some f of x, and it may depend on x alone. Y is another dynamical system, and this I'll indicate as y, right? Now, this basically means I've got two dynamical systems which don't even need to be identical. All right? Now, I want to couple them, zeta x, which may depend on both x and y, and zeta y, which may also depend on both x and y. All right? And my objective is to get that y is some unique function of x. Okay, I'm going to, these are two coupling, and this is this unique function. All right. Now what we have done uh, in, in this earlier example, for example, this one over here, Okay, when you, what we've done in this particular example is to say this uh, x is f, whatever, this is f of x, this is f of y, and we said that this term was zero, zeta x is zero, because there is no term over there, 
and zeta y had both x and y in it. Okay. And when we couple them like this, then we eventually saw that although the relationship y is equal to phi of x was very likely to be non-differentiable and you know it's, it's complicated. I mean, look at the middle, the middle line over there. It's some, oh, sorry, over here. Like this is a. Uh, this is not a simple relation between x and y. However, it was unique. All right. Okay. Now, in the approach that I want to describe. Okay. In the approach, okay. So, when this function is smooth and when when this function is non-differentiable, the uh, terminology in the field is that this is called weak generalized synchronization, and when it is differentiable, it's called strong generalized synchronization. Right. And what I want to uh, propose is that supposing I have a nice, you know, supposing it's a differentiable function and I specify this, given this, can I determine these two? Namely, can I determine the coupling that, will, that is guaranteed to give me this? For example, if I want y to be equal to x, sorry, if I want y to be equal to x, that is the case of perfect synchronization, what is the coupling that I have to add to the two of them? Right? Yes, I know I have introduced several types of coupling that give you identical stuff, but is there a general framework which says, if I want a particular kind of relation between these two, can I deduce the coupling that I must add? Right? Namely, can I reverse engineer this process? OK. So for that, right? So let me, let me say that this functional relationship, the notation is a little messy, but please bear with me. All right? The idea is to specify the relationship that I want and deduce the coupling. And uh, if I take the two variables of the system like so, and this is your functional relationship that is required, then this comes out to be a set of several conditions. See, for example, if I want perfect synchronization, then phi1 of xy is x1 equals y1. Phi 2 is x2 equals y2, phi 3 is x3 equals y3, and so on. And that will give me this condition of perfect synchronization. OK, I'm going to be giving you these notes, so the algebra is something that I hope you will work out. And the idea is the following. Supposing I have a surface inside a phase space and I want my dynamics to be on that surface. This surface is the synchronization manifold, and I want my dynamics to be on that surface. The main idea over here is that I would like my coupling to bring me to that surface and then stay on that surface. So the way in which this is done you bring nearby trajectories onto the surface, let's say the surface is the plane, and then make sure that the motion stays on the plane. If the motion is staying on the plane, it has to be orthogonal to the normals on the surface. Right? So at every point on the surface, there are you know, normals. If I want my motion to stay orthogonal to that, that is done by the coupling. Okay. 
And then it frees me away from what kind of surface I need this to be. So long as I can define normals to the surface everywhere. Okay, so the algebra is not particularly difficult. Uh, okay, so in order that this submanifold specified is invariant, a trajectory that is in this submanifold will remain on it. So we do that by asking that the flow direction be orthogonal to the normal vectors at any point. All right? So now the normals are given by very straightforward. The normals are just given by the, uh, you know, the derivative, of the, I mean, the divergence at that point over there, right? And if you define all the normals to be this gothic n and the flow equations to be that, the flow, the, this is just the flow equations. I've got uh, these normals and the requirement is that the flow direction is, you know, that the cross product of the normals and the flow is zero, then it, then, uh, and you add the coupling zeta, you find that this is the equation that has to be solved. Now, this is not unique because the dimension of n, n is a, uh, in this particular case, it is a 3 cross 6 vector, right? Zetas are 6 dimensional. So these, this set of equations gives you many, many sets of solutions, underscoring the fact that synchronization is not a unique problem. You've already seen examples of it. I showed you that Lorenz, uh, Lorenz was uh, getting synchronized with master-slave, then it was getting synchronized with x1 minus x2. Many forms will give you the same synchronization. But now that you have an equation like this, this is a matrix equation, and this is underdetermined. So uh, there will be many, many forms of coupling that this is the coupling matrix over here, right? So many, many forms of coupling that will give you the same requirement. But all of them will not be equally stable. So because they may not all be equally stable, you can add stabilizing <laughs> terms. Namely, you can add some extra term which vanishes on the manifold. So if you're adding a term which vanishes on the manifold, then it doesn't, again, it doesn't affect the dynamics, all right? Okay. So uh, this, is your, this is your target surface, and how do you bring it in? It's probably easy to at least demonstrate how this happens with one example, all right? At every point on the submanifold, you want the eigenvalues of this Jacobian matrix to be negative. And you can arrange that by a certain amount of art. But let me, let me give you an example of how this works. If I've got two, copy, two Lorenzes, okay, these are two copies of the Lorenz, which I've just written it in x1, x2, x3, rather than x, y, z. Okay. The condition that I want on my submanifold is not x1 equals y1, x2 equals y2, and x3 equals y3, but some scaled version of the, of the three. So x1 is equal to a times b times c times. So this is like taking this diagonal synchronization manifold and just you know, flipping it around or doing whatever you want with it. You know. okay. Now, this is my f of x, this is my f of y, this is my phi, that is the three constraints that I want, and I put it back into, yeah, so I put it back into this equation over here. I know what the normals are, I know what fx is, and I know the normals over here. The thing to do is to determine what is zeta, what is the coupling. Yeah? 
You have got the equations of the plane, right? See, the, this is your manifold. So it's x1 minus a y1, x2 minus b y2, x3 minus b y3. And at any point x, y, z, you can figure out the normals. All right? OK, so, and that's the answer. One particular solution that was found was that zeta 1 is that, zeta 2 is that. I mean, th these are messy. Th there's nothing intuitive about it. But if I take a equals 1, b equals 2, c equals 3, that is, I just take the Lorentz and I want to blow it up. Right? With that coupling, that's the answer. So you can see that, and, and when you sort of plot it in the right dimensions, you will see that x, I mean, that this manifold is not the usual perfect synchronization manifold. This is, this is what's called projective synchronization. Yeah? So now it turns out that there's a lot of choice that is available. I could choose, in fact, zeta 1 over here to be 0, 0, 0, in which case x would be the master, and whatever comes out on this side would be the slave. Namely, this uh, formalism that I have over here, namely, sorry, you know, namely to find, to find the coupling, given all the others that are known, because it is non-unique, I can just choose a variety of different uh, kinds of coupling forms. So, uh, so here is a, it also, I mean, I should tell you that it doesn't matter that the systems have to be identical, they can be different and so on. Exactly. Yeah. No, this is not the only, I'm going to show you in this next example, I'm going to show you three couplings that do the same job. All right? Okay. Okay, so here is another objective. Let's say x1 equals y1, x2 equals y2, but now x3 squared is equal to y3. All right? So this is, this is a, a surface which is no longer just flat. This is a surface which is, at least in one, one direction, it is curved between x3 and y3. Yeah? So again, you go back and put down all those equations, calculate the normals, ta, 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 and that's the answer. All right? So uh, I made this x system the master. I made the y system the slave. And so the master's coupling is zero. The master is not coupled to the slave. And here's the slave being coupled to the master in whichever, some complicated way, right? And you can see, I mean, visually, two things over here. One, of course, that the third variable is just the square taken up there. And uh, I've plotted this on the, on, you know, on a subspace. And you can see the curvature that it is following, you know, this x, uh, what, what is it? Uh, x3 squared is equal to y3. It's just a simple parabola over there. And, and this is the coupling that does it, all right? And to ask, I mean, is this the only coupling that will do it? No. Uh, I can, instead of taking the constraints this way, I can say that x3 is equal to the square root of y3. It's the same constraint, right? And then I can make y the master and x the slave, if you like. 
Or I can say, let's go for bidirectional coupling. Right? So if I make Y the master and X the slave, that's the coupling that will bring it on to uh, this, this blue one, I think. Right? And if I say that let, let the coupling be bidirectional on both sides, then I get that coupling and I get the red trajectory. Yeah? This is very particular to Lorenz because Lorenz is always positive in okay. the Z. Okay. okay. And then when we say the, the coupling is bidirectional, yeah. in this in this coupling that we call how can how can we can I see that this is bidirectional? Because both uh, zeta one and zeta two are non zero. See this is this is unidirectional because all the coupling terms here are zero. Right? I mean, this, this is lo lots of algebra, but what I want to point out is that once you've got the manifold, you come onto the manifold and you're stuck there, but you could be stuck in different parts of it. You see, so all these solutions belong to the same manifold? They, they're all in the same manifold, right? And they all have the same relationship that x3 squared is equal to y3, but they're on different parts of it, okay. right? And this kind of reverse engineering is not only it's possible, right? Because, I mean, you can ask whether this is a natural coupling or not, but, you know, we've got to go beyond just x1 minus x2. We need to sort of expand the idea, especially in neuronal systems. Your couplings are crazy. I mean, I know that people are interested in such systems. And you know, the, the coupling is not always a simple diffusive coupling or nearest neighbor or what have you. So I'm just alerting you to the fact that couplings can be a zoology in themselves. All right? So this works, this works, the earlier one also, this also works. All of them will bring the dynamics to the same manifold, sub-manifold, and all of them will keep it there because they are actually quite stable. Yeah. But did you have some example, essentially example, of a situation where we want to have some relation between two systems? Uh... Yes, sir. See, it's coming. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, equation, the, the equation that we are imposing, uh, though, it is one equation, no? Yeah. So it would give uh, a, a... No, it's a matrix equation. No, no. Can you, can you show the equation again? That one. So N is a... It's a N is a 6 by 3 matrix. And uh, so it's not just the, the, the normal, but it's the, of the surface, but it's uh, like how they construct it. Um, it Oh, Tommaso, I mean, this is, just go to, I, I'm going to give you the reference. So there's a paper we wrote in Pizravi, uh, which That's sort of, it's not just the normal of the surface. It is the normal of the surface, it's just going to take it in all directions. So then it comes, you know, it's sort of the big matrix which comes out. Is the, okay, is the tensor product with itself? Big one? The tensor product with itself. Uh, I'm not sure, but we, we, we can discuss this. Meaning it's, it's just sort of very straightforward mathematics and linear, linear stuff. It's just that you come up with a set of equations which have got more, uh, more unknowns, uh, sorry, more constraints than unknowns or some such thing like that. So you finally find many, many solutions. And I'm going to show you an example, uh, both, yeah? Yeah. Many couplings, as you said. So, is there any generalized protocol by which, from given one solution, we can generate some other solution from the rest? Um, no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't a thought about it in that way that you go from one solution to another. 
Um, but uh, no, I don't think there is a protocol. Um, see, there are, depending on your applications, there are some solutions or some couplings which are natural and some which are unnatural. To give you an example, supposing I wanted to uh, implement this on a um, electronic circuit. I make one circuit with uh, Lorenz 1 and make another circuit, and how do I couple them? Uh, this is actually a very good coupling to do that. For this, I mean, this is just hell because I've got x1, x2, x3 divided by y3. You know, so these are, in a sense, not very natural couplings, they're just mathematical. Right? But the fact that you can have many different couplings should in a sense, inspire. Okay? I mean, okay, all right. I mean, the thing is also that when people present work on synchronization, it's almost always like this. I have got this one system, I've got another system, I couple them like this, and oh, see, they have synchronized. Uh, but the question is really, is this the only way to synchronize them? The answer is no. Infinite number of uh, couplings will give you synchronization. I'm now thinking from the next step onwards that can you engineer synchronization? That is, just given some arbitrary systems, can you make them synchronized? And this is one way of at least. The simplest way is, of course, to couple them with an infinite strength. And then they always synchronize. But what you want to do is something a little more subtle and less invasive, so this is one way. Okay. All right. So, um, this, when I started my lectures, I thanked Matteo especially for a particular question. I had presented some of this at a meeting. Matteo was in the audience, and he said that, you know, can you do something to look at uh, spatial freedoms, for example, something like that. Okay, so that is a picture uh, of uh, birds. Okay, so this is a flock of birds, uh, about a million or so. And uh, there is a photographer in Barcelona called Xavi, uh, who has now become a very good friend of mine, uh, because I keep on stealing his pictures. <laughs> All right. So when you take a set of birds like that, what, what Xavi does is uh, to focus on the flight of a bird, videograph it, and then uh, superimpose stills from that. So you can see over here the wave pattern, i.e. an oscillator, moving in three-dimensional space. Right? And here's a whole bunch of them. Right? And when you look at them a little closer, uh, see there are different heights. That's why the, the trajectories seem to be crossing. Uh, but as you see them, I mean, you just take this pair. I mean, the two oscillators that are there are definitely in some kind of synchronization. Right? And, I mean, you look at various pairs of them. You've got these... So you, what you really have are moving uh, oscillators. Right? And they have to have a certain relationship of synchrony. Otherwise, they're going to be colliding into one another. And anybody who's watched these huge flocks of birds, you know that they don't, they, they, they die because a predator will come, and uh, so that's the predator over there. You can see that predator coming in, sort of, you know, the hawk swooping through that bloody flock, and you can, I mean, uh, I mean, all these have escaped, all those have escaped, but there's one sad chap over there who's gone, right? But they don't kill themselves by colliding into one another, right? Unlike Tesla cars. <laughs> right. Okay, so the question is that, uh, what, what can we do with this? All right, so uh, I will come back to discussing flocking in another lecture, but I just want to show you one, uh, one particular thing, all right? 
Now, what you want is the same, uh, the same objectives. Your uncoupled equations are that. You want to do the coupling like so. Then there turns out to be a very simple way of making this happen. The condition is you want phi of x minus y is equal to 0. So uh, if that is my condition over there, right? and I've got x dot is equal to f of x, let me already put psi of x equals 0. So that's going to be the master. All right? Then I've got y dot is equal to that equation over there, given psi x is equal to 0. Let me choose. Let me choose zeta of y is this quantity, okay? where j is this Jacobian. And that eventually gives me this following equation. I mean, I just put in all the various variables here and there. And eventually, all I get out of this is that d by dt of phi x minus y, this is the constraint that I want, is just equal to minus r times the same constraint, which means that phi x minus y is exponentially going to go to 0. Yeah? Now, what happens is, therefore, you've got x dot is equal to f of x, and y dot, y dot has forgotten all about f of y. You see, we started with x dot is that, and y was f of x, sorry, f of y plus something. It's completely forgotten. Namely, you can make these things happen if you completely destroy the dynamics of the slave. Right? But there is one silver lining. If the constraint is linear, namely if, f, if phi of x is x plus c, then you get the following sets of equations saying that the master moves with one velocity. This is, after all, the velocity of x. Right? The slave moves with the same velocity in the flock. They're all flying at essentially the same speed. Otherwise, they're going to be colliding into one another. And they keep, and this is your constraint. This is your additional constraint. Okay? I mean, this is your coupling constraint. Call it what you will. All right? So if you do that, then the following emerges. First of all, I just do as an example of two Van der Poel oscillators. Here is one Van der Poel oscillator. Here is the other Van der Poel oscillator. And I just want them to be separated by a distance a in x and b in y. All right? So x1, x2 minus x1 is equal to a, y2 minus y1 is equal to b. That is, I want them to have the same dynamics. I just want them to be apart from one another. And that is. I hope you can see this green thingy over here. So the two of them are just separated from one another. They are both going around the phase plane. But, and this is the coupling that I can, you know, if I go through the entire algebra that I've been talking about, that is the kind of coupling that I have. So this is the master, that is the slave, and so on. Yeah? So it's, it's actually possible to put in a constraint which is just purely spatial. All right. Now, birds are not flying in Van der Poel loops. So, supposing I have the blue trajectory as just some trajectory of the birds that are flying by, uh, I can make any other bird follow exactly the same trajectory. In fact, I can make 20 of them follow the same trajectory. Right. Once again, <laughs> no, it, I mean, it's, this is again just mathematics. There's one master that's following some trajectory, all the slaves, same velocity, keeping the distance fixed from one another. There's even a little noise being added over here. 
and you can see how they all come together. Yeah. It is just now that the spatial, the spatial synchronization, I mean, it's the same formalism. It is that my constraint, my constraint is just that the distance between the two is a constant number. I know we, we did, but, uh, well, I mean, and I'm saying that if some of the degrees of freedom are spatial, then it turns out that corresponding to those, all I really require is this sort of this linear, uh, you know, that, that has just this linear part to it, right? I mean, this is not as if it's a new thing. It is just an application of the old formalism to a, to a situation where that's the only thing. And then you have even simpler conditions, right? And, uh, right? and because it's simpler and you can make this happen, uh, we said, all right, let's take some drones and put it on there. It's not the greatest demonstration, but you can see. There's an intruder who comes in. That's an intruder, <laughs> not being controlled. But OK, it's the point I really want to make is that you can, put, you can implement this algorithm in, in sort of you know, autonomous vehicles and then make one of them the master. All the others are following specified distances from the master. And this is in three dimensions, so everything sort of there's a little aberration in your visualization because we had to take the pictures from the ground and this is up in the air. But basically you can see that they all move together in, a, in the required uh, constraint, yeah? Right. One of them, only one of them is controlled and every other drone is taking its instructions from the master. See? See, over here, we had the dynamics of the slave having some dynamics. You know, uncoupled, of course, it was just the dynamics of the slave, and then there was the coupling. With, it just turns out that that entire procedure just works. I mean, it's just algebra over here. Right? But also, if you think about it, if you've got two objects that are moving, if this one is moving very fast and this one, in order to keep a spatial distance, which is fixed, has to move with the same velocity. If it doesn't move with the same velocity, then the distance between them is just going to keep increasing. So if you want the distance to be fixed, then you've got to make sure that the velocities are the same. Yeah? Isn't it because we've chosen the coupling minus f of y? Yeah. Absolutely. See, the point is with, it, with autonomous vehicles, you've got to control it somehow. Otherwise, you're going to be having collisions and things. I mean, my initial idea in doing this work was to actually try to understand whether we can put in these kinds of just simple linear constraints and make things work. Right? And then you think in terms of drones, you want them to, well, the applications of drones are not particularly nice these days, but you can imagine wanting many drones to go and deliver some target. Right? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. So for n number of uh, followers, there should be some kind of interaction between the followers to avoid um, device collision or to have a private sense of their human 
Well, in the, so right now we have not put in any interaction between the followers, but we have just said that if the leader uh, has specified relations with the followers which are non-intersecting, then it shouldn't matter. But one can imagine doing more sophisticated stuff. In particular, uh, it, it was my tragedy that I worked with a company that was more interested in drone shows than anything else. Uh, no, if you're looking at drone shows, you want to make money, and uh, which is not the most evil thing in the world. But you, the, the trouble with drone show people is that they all work with 200 gram drones. And with 200 gram drones, there's a little gust of wind, and the drone is flying off on its own. So I haven't given up completely, but no. <laughs> OK, no, the point is that this may or uh, Yeah, so that, that was the end of it. See, the, the, uh, the point is that uh, these may or may not be uh, applicable to, just one second, let me try to get back to that one slide that I wanted. OK, you can. You can see that the spatial separation between different elements of this is essentially fixed. And they're all moving around some, I mean, I don't know whether there is a single master or not, but there is something which organizes all of them into this kind of very, uh, almost like a lattice, right? They're all moving on that. And I know it's a step between this and you know drones that are designed to keep a certain distance apart and so on and so forth. But one of the applications we are working on now is to say that what if the distance between any of these two objects is a pre-specified function of time, right? So if you've got the, the distance has to go as cosine omega t, can you have these drones going in and out like that? Uh, or you know, uh, this again is of course. I mean, it's huge and beautiful, but um, there is another point over here. Uncoupled, a million birds in configuration space, uh, what is the dimension of that configuration space? Three million, right? Each one of them is three. Now, this object, whatever it is, does not have three million degrees of freedom. They're all moving together with a constraint. And so one would find that, you know, the, uh, that they don't, they don't have, it, the synchronization manifold over here, it, it's not three, but it's not something like three million. It's probably, even allowing for all the variations in between, I don't know whether it is much, much more than about 20 or 30. See, if they were all moving together as a rigid body, it would be three. Okay, so this is a deformable body, but it's certainly not as if all the birds are flying around. So we are coming down to a lower dimensional submanifold. So in the language that I would like to say that yes, there is some kind of synchrony happening over here. It's not trivial synchrony of the, you know, x1 equals x2. It's not even the, the simple one that I showed you with the drones where distances are fixed, right? Because there again, you've got, you know, each one of the drones has got three freedoms. Constraints bring you down to uh, nine minus some six constraints or something. No. A million followers. So, shouldn't this work the same if we assume that they were by or million where wide connected uh, couplings instead of one master and a million? Followers? No, clearly there is, I mean, all theories of this Parisi onwards don't have a master and slaves. All they say is that each bird looks at seven birds around it and 
then goes to an average uh, distance, etc. My point more is really to say that when such a thing happens, the dimension reduction is something very important in this case, right? And dimension reduction, like coarse graining, like is, is a way of going from, uh, you know, what I've done is to do the dimension reduction in the dynamical system's point of view. From a statistical system, all you say is that seven around, but there is no constraint that is put on the distance between the birds, right? They, they're all supposed to have the same velocity or some such thing like that, you know, to start with. You know, Vichek model, I, I don't know, some of you might have studied this Vichek model or similar such models of flocking. I will come to it in a later lecture. I hope you all notice that I will be giving my lecture on um, Wednesday afternoon and no lecture on Thursday because you'll have an exam in any case. And then Friday is our exam, okay? I've been requested to stop my class a little early today because of the uh, CISA entrance exam. Now that the class is a little fuller, who, who is taking the CISA entrance exam? One. Oh, and the others are not here. The others are already taking that. Who's David? You're David? <laughs> I've always thought of you as Lao. You're Dr. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop today, um, and tomorrow we'll come back to other aspects. Uh, is everyone cool about I'm not going to come back to generalized synchrony unless you want to have a private discussion sometime. We can do that. Uh, but you're cool with the ideas of chaotic synchronization, Generalized synchrony and so on. Yeah? Yes. It does. It, it does. I mean, th that's why it is a controversial topic. You know, it depends on the variance of the noise, it depends on the intensity of the noise, and so on. So, uh, I mean, there are some people who don't believe in it at all. Uh, I, I introduced it only to tell you that so long as two systems are subject to the same kinds of fluctuations, there are situations when they become completely correlated. That fluctuation could be chaotic signals, it could be periodic signals, it could be quasi-periodic signals, in which case you have something totally different and interesting. And it can even be noise. Yeah?